The following presentation is from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you in the house of the Lord today. And so thankful for the Spirit's presence as we have gathered together in His name to worship Him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God. We thank you for all of your blessings. We thank you, God, for your presence in this place. We thank you for the opportunity to worship and to exalt your name. And Lord, as we do worship you today and as we seek your face, we pray that you would speak to us through your word this morning. That you would impress it upon our hearts, that you would help us to apply it to our lives, and help us, Lord, to follow you. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, on Friday, we'll go through a tradition that we go through at least every four years, the presidential inauguration. The inauguration marks the commencement of the president's term of office. Here in Matthew chapter 4, he presents the commencement of Jesus' ministry as the Messiah. The commencement of Jesus' ministry as the Messiah. Just as the first 100 days of a president's term are often closely watched in order to get insights into things to come, so Matthew invites us to inspect these opening events of Jesus' public ministry in order to get a glimpse of what is to follow in Jesus' ministry. Everything that is to follow is found here in early form. So this morning we want to examine these major facets of Jesus' debut as the Son of God. First, the time. The time. Instead of January 20th, Jesus' ministry begins when John the Baptist is arrested. This seemingly offhanded detail that John was placed into custody is actually quite significant. You see, Matthew considered John the Baptist to be a pivotal figure, considered him to be a hinge on which the ages shifted. Before John, there was the time of the law and the prophets, and after John, there is the messianic age of Jesus. And John himself faces both directions. He's the last of the old prophets, and he's the first of the gospel preachers. So when John is arrested and he is removed from the scene, it's a cue that the time has come. It's a cue that the plates have shifted and that the earthquake of the promised messianic age has begun to shake the foundations of the whole world. The moment has arrived for Jesus, the Messiah, to stir in to action. So that's the when, that's the time when John the Baptist was arrested. Now what about the place? Jesus does not begin his ministry in the capital city. He launches his ministry in Galilee, working out of the town of Capernaum as a home base. Capernaum. Seriously? This is, this is crazy, right? If you're going to establish yourself as a public figure, you try to nudge your way into the limelight, not out of it. You want to go to New York and get interviewed by Matt Lauer on the Today Show, or, or you want to go to D.C. and be among the halls of power. You don't drive over to Kitzmiller and hang out with some of the locals at the Coal Bucket Cafe. <laughs> but in essence, that's what Jesus was doing. Many people thought Jesus messed up. He gave up the potential spotlight of Jerusalem in favor of Capernaum, a place out of the backwaters of Palestine, a place that was 85 miles away from Jerusalem. And 85 miles might not sound like much to us, but we're accustomed to driving 70 miles an hour, right? But in that day, nothing moved faster than a donkey could plod, and 85 miles was far away. So Jesus has distanced himself from Jerusalem. He's distanced himself from the political and the religious center. So maybe it was Jesus' way of saying, that God's kingdom is not tied to a single location. Maybe it was Jesus' way of saying that the kingdom can't be restricted to the spots on the map that we deem important. Maybe it was Jesus' way of saying that the kingdom can come and does come most anywhere and everywhere. Capernaum might not have been the logical place to begin his ministry, but it was theological. Jesus has come to this world for the sake of the world, for all of it, and there are no unimportant places. There are no places where the presence or the preaching of Jesus would be wasted. But this shift in geography is so surprising and, and so shocking that Matthew has to bring in a prophetic heavyweight. He has to bring in the prophetic heavyweight of Isaiah 
to reassure his readers that this move makes sense. Matthew connects Jesus' relocation to Capernaum to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Those verses refer to the land of Zebulun and Naphtali on the road by the sea across the Jordan, the Galilee of the Gentiles. And that describes Capernaum, a place on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. So this linkage with Isaiah works in two ways. First, as an Old Testament prophecy, it expresses Matthew's conviction that Jesus' life is unfolding not according to random chance, but according to God's plan. And secondly, the mention of Gentiles anticipates the spread of the gospel, the spread of the gospel beyond the boundaries of Judaism and to all the nations. So we have the time, we have the place, and next comes the message. Jesus' inaugural speech, his inaugural address. Jesus begins his ministry with a sermon, and it's a short sermon, probably as short as you'd like this one to be. Here's the whole sermon. I'm going to quote the whole thing for you. Okay, here it comes. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. That's it. That's the sermon. Good sermon, eh? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. You know what? No, no what surprises me? Jesus' first sermon is a knockoff from John the Baptist. That's right. Jesus is a plagiarizer. Jesus' first sermon is a word-for-word -word repetition of John's sermon from Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. And you know, it's nice and all that, that John, Jesus affirms the ministry of John, but shouldn't Jesus be able to say something more? Well, even though the message of the kingdom has not changed, the messenger has, and that is the crucial difference. You see, when John said that the kingdom had come near, it was like a person pointing to a rain cloud on the horizon and saying, saying, oh, refreshing uh, showers are going to come soon. But when Jesus says that the kingdom is drawn near, it means that the hoped for kingdom was beginning to happen, that it was happening in and through him. And the inauguration of his ministry and his words and deeds, the cloudburst of the kingdom has begun. What does Jesus' message mean? What is encompassed by the words, the kingdom of heaven has come near? We're not told everything about this kingdom at this point in Matthew's gospel. Here he only gives us a summary message of Jesus' teaching. The rest of his gospel will provide a more complete picture of the kingdom of heaven. and We're going to be looking at some of this in the next few weeks. But we can say a few things to help us to unpack this message here right up front. First, Matthew normally has Jesus speak of the kingdom of heaven. The other gospels use the phrase the kingdom of God. Saying heaven instead of God was a regular Jewish way of avoiding the word God out of reverence and respect. So the kingdom of heaven does not mean a place. The kingdom of heaven does not mean a place. In this sense, when it talks about the kingdom of heaven, heaven is not the place where God's people go after death. No, kingdom of heaven means the same thing as kingdom of God. And any first century Jew that heard someone talk about God's kingdom or the kingdom of heaven would know what this meant. This meant revolution. It meant revolution because Jesus grew up in the shadow of kingdom movement. The Romans had conquered his homeland about 60 years before he was born. And they were the last in a long line of pagan nations to, to come and conquer the Jewish people. Most Jews resented the arrangement and they longed for a chance to revolt. But the Jews weren't just eager for freedom in the way that most subject people are. They wanted it because of what they believed about God and themselves and the world. You see, if there was one God who had made the whole world, and if they were his special people, then it couldn't be God's will to have these pagan foreigners ruling over them. And what's more, God had made promises in the scriptures and through the prophets. He promised that one day God would indeed rescue them and, and put everything right. And these promises focused on one thing in particular. One thing, that God would become king. King not only of Israel, but of the whole world. A king who would bring justice and peace at last. A king who would turn the upside down world the white right way up again. There should be no king but God, these revolutionaries believed. God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, was what they longed for, what they prayed for, what they worked for, and what they were prepared for. To die for. And now here comes Jesus, and he's declaring that God's kingdom, he's declaring that the sovereign rule of heaven was approaching like an express train. And those who were standing idly by had better take note and get out of the way. 
People had better get their act together while there's time. And the word for that, the word that Jesus uses is repent. Repent. Now the trouble with that word is that we often misunderstand it. We think that it means, I want to feel bad about myself. I got to feel bad about myself. That's what repentance means. But it doesn't. Repentance means change direction. It means turn around and go the other way or stop what you're doing and do the opposite instead. How you feel about it really isn't the important thing. It's what you do that matters. Jesus believed that his contemporaries were going in the wrong direction. They were bent on revolution of the standard kind. They were using the weapons of this world, military resistance to occupying forces. And the problem with all of these movements was that they were fighting darkness with darkness. But Israel was called, and Jesus was called, to bring God's light into the world. Jesus' call to repent was a call for the people to stop rushing towards violence, to stop rushing towards evil and darkness, and instead they should go the other way towards God's kingdom of light and peace and healing and forgiveness. They needed to turn around because the kingdom is coming, but they were standing in the way. One commentator paraphrases Jesus' sermon this way. Move, move, because here comes the whole new world of God. Move, because here comes the whole new world of God. Now, if you see someone crossing a street and you notice a garbage truck barreling down the road, you might, if you're nice, yell, hey, look out, right? Jesus' words have that same urgency. Look out, move, because a whole new world is headed straight towards you. Now, if someone tells you to watch out when you're crossing a street, but you just stand there, something's going to happen quite soon, especially if it's a garbage truck, right? You're going to get barreled over. Jesus' point's the same. Jesus' point's the same. You can't hear that the kingdom is approaching and they just stand there with your hands in your pockets. You need to repent. You need to turn around so that you're ready to embrace this kingdom so that you can hop onto the kingdom instead of getting crushed by it as it rolls over you. That message today is just as urgent as it was then, if not more so for those of us who live on this side of Calvary and Easter we're still guilty of trying to fight the problems with the weapons of this world. We're still trying to, to fight them by the normal modes of power and trying to work our way up into the halls of power. But Jesus' kingdom works a different way. And Matthew would want to say to us that the kingdom that Jesus established now faces us with the same challenge. Are we working? Are we working to extend God's kingdom? Or are we just standing in the way? The drawing near of God's reign calls for a basic reorientation, for a turnaround, for a reversal of direction. And that's the heart of Jesus' inaugural message. Well, so we've had the time, we've had the place, we have the message. Now we have the putting together of Jesus' cabinet. That's right. Jesus is choosing his appointees. The calling of these four fishermen. He doesn't choose people with very good credentials, does he? Peter, Andrew, James, and John. This calling scene highlights the basic dynamics of the calling of all disciples. As Matthew presents what happened there by the Sea of Galilee, he emphasizes three things. First, he emphasizes the family relationships of those involved. Peter and Andrew are specified as brothers, and so are James and John. In fact, Matthew is so eager to underscore these brother relationship that he mentions it twice in the same sentence for both Peter and Andrew and James and John. And he also mentions twice that Zebedee is the father of James and John. Secondly, Matthew emphasizes their occupation. He stresses the fact that they were fishermen. And we see them in action as Jesus comes. They're doing their jobs. They're sailing in a boat. They're mending nets. They're casting nets. Jesus' words, follow me and I will make you fish for people. That obviously connects to their occupation, to their role as fishermen. Third, Matthew stresses the swiftness of their reaction to Jesus. In the case of each of these brothers, the response to Jesus is immediate. Instantly, they left their nets. Instantly, they left their boats. They left their father, and they followed Jesus. Taken as a whole, then, the calling of these four disciples makes it clear that Jesus summons people from the fabric of relationships, from the fabric of relationships, brother, sister, daughter, son, father, mother, and he also summons people from the midst of the workaday world, from fishing and teaching and clerking and cooking and building and all those other occupations. 
He takes them from those family relationships and from the midst of the workaday world into a new set of relationships and to a new vocation. So what does that mean? Does that mean that Jesus calls into question our family ties and creates conflict with our occupations? Yes, that's what it means. The kingdom of heaven doesn't exist to serve the family. The family exists to serve the kingdom of heaven. And the goal of the kingdom is not to serve us and making us more effective and productive in our jobs. You often hear this theology talked about. Just follow Jesus. You name it and you claim it and and you'll be successful in your work and you'll be rich. It'll be great. Our work is truly effective only when it serves and it expresses the will of God. The patterns of our lives are not made secure by the kingdom of heaven. That's a false teaching that our, our lives are made secure because we're members of the kingdom of heaven. In fact, Our lives are not made secure by the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven rearranges our lives and makes them into the new design of God's own making. Being in the kingdom of heaven is not a very secure place. In these stories of the calling of the disciples, Jesus disrupts family structures and he disrupts patterns of working and living. He does so, however, not to destroy them, but to renew them. Peter and Andrew do not cease being brothers. They are now brothers who do the will of God. James and John do not cease being sons. But they are now not only children of Zebedee, but they are also children of God. And all four of these disciples leave their fishing nets. But you know what? They don't stop fishing. Because of the nearness of the kingdom, they now have a little bit different type of fishing. They are fishing for people. Their past has not been eradicated, but it has been transformed by Jesus' call to follow. And Jesus is calling us also to be transformed. He takes us from our places, our relationships, and our work, and He transforms them so that they now serve the kingdom of God. So this Friday, the world's attention will be turned to Washington, D.C. to watch a new president begin his term of office. When Jesus began His ministry, no one really took note. No, it was an ordinary place. But in that ordinary place, Jesus called ordinary people right in the middle of their ordinary lives and their ordinary work to do extraordinary things. And you know what? You know what? He still does. He still does. By His Spirit, Jesus still comes to ordinary places. Ordinary places like Oakland. And He calls ordinary people, ordinary people like you and me, And He calls us in the midst of our ordinary, everyday activities to declare an extraordinary message, to declare that the kingdom of heaven has arrived, and He calls us to be bearers of His message of reconciliation and redemption. Yes, Jesus continues to call ordinary, everyday people from all works of life to proclaim Jesus' word and to continue Jesus' mission. So let me ask you what the Holy Spirit might be asking you this morning. How is God calling you? How is God calling you to a life of faith and meaning and purpose here and now? How does God want to transform your relationships? How does God want to transform your work? And how will you respond to the call of God? We ask that in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for this word from the Gospel of Matthew. We thank You, God, for Your inaugural ministry, for the commencement of Your ministry, that as You came, Lord, and You showed forth, not in the halls of power, not in the places where we expected You to be, but out in the -the out-of-the-way places, in the ordinary places. It gives us that assurance today that You still, God, are working in ordinary places and in ordinary lives in ordinary lives like those of Peter and James and Andrew and John. We thank you, God, that you're still calling us today. Lord, may we be faithful to hear your call. May you speak to our hearts and show us, God, how you want us to reorient our lives around your kingdom, this kingdom of heaven. I pray, God, that you would help us to live as your disciples and to be faithful, God, that when you come and you call us, that we would faithfully follow you And that we then would faithfully proclaim this message that you've given us to the world. The message that the kingdom of God has come in the person of Jesus. And that we can get on board as we repent and follow him. God, we're often guilty of trying to solve our problems and the problems of this world through the weapons of this world. Help us, God, to recognize that you want to do that by the power of your spirit. Help us to yield to your spirit. 
and help us, God, to be the people, the disciples you've called us to be. We pray this in the wonderful and most precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The preceding presentation came from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland.